Okay, this is a reaction video, special edition, ads of the past that would be banned today. This is from Rerun Zone. Please click like, share, and subscribe for them, and like, share, and subscribe for me as well. Now, I don't, you know, th there's a lot of things that I remember seeing in the past that would have been banned today. And even, I mean, even just things that people say in movies of the past that would be, what, what you wouldn't hear today. Like I, but if you think of like TV shows like the All in the Family, the Jeffersons, things like that, from All in the Family was a spinoff from a British show. <clears throat> these are <clears throat> these are things that, that that wouldn't fly in today, or they wouldn't put on the air. But I am kind of curious about this. This is from Rerun Zone. Like I said, please click like, share, and subscribe for them, and like, share, and subscribe for me. But uh, this adds to the past that would be banned today. <laughs> These are genuine ads from the past. If you have a sensitive nature, some of these ads may disturb you. These are ads of the past that would be banned today. Yeah, we don't we don't have uh, cigarette ads on um, uh, anymore. Uh, you know, that, I don't think you see, think you see them in uh, in uh, magazines anymore because that's where they did a lot of their advertising. But yeah, let's take a look at these. <coughs> this cigarette, Chesterfield King gives all the advantages of extra length and much more. The great taste of 21 vintage tobaccos grown mild. That's Rod Sterling from the Twilight Zone. Aged mild and blended mild. No wonder they satisfy so completely. One of the oldest ways to market something is through testimonials. In most of the early tobacco ads, beautiful upper-class men and women were shown smoking. By the 1930s, tobacco companies were paying famous people, especially movie stars, to advertise their products. In the 1950s and 60s, famous TV stars were also used. Then they even had athletes. I think Frank Gifford was a uh, played played uh, NFL, NFL football, and uh, he did a cigarette ad. In 1964, it became illegal for tobacco companies to use famous people to help sell their products, and cigarette advertising shifted to more ordinary people. Some ads mix superstars with everyday people to show that you might smoke the same cigarette as your favorite movie star or sports hero. Yeah, Fred Astaire. You have a bunch of different uh, celebrities on the bottom there. Yeah, okay. The individuals in cigarette advertisements were far from average, though, since almost all of the men and women were young, thin, gorgeous, and having a fantastic time. Now, I know there were a lot of sexist ads out there, and I'm kind of curious what these are. Um, but, yeah, I, uh, like, ads of the past, and you got to take them in context. If, you, if you're offended, you don't need to watch this video, but I, I don't know what we're going to watch. But uh, uh, it, it, it was a different time. So when you look back, you may say, we would never would have done anything like that. And I don't even know what we're going to see yet. But, uh, yeah, uh, different time. This flat tire needs a man, but when there's no... Yeah, a woman can't f change a flat tire. It's, she's perfectly incapable of doing anything of the sort, so she needs a man. Good year should be. Oh, the perks of being a woman. Cooking. Cl and a... <laughs> she doesn't care. It's, what, are they, what are they advertising here? Uh, water... Wrinkles in in her dress. Oh, she doesn't get it. It's look like it's, it's a, uh, uh, a motor oil. God, that's a strange ad. Nobody would ever do that. Cleaning, okay. waiting on your man. <laughs> then, when you have the time, focus on getting that sexy shape that every man. That was actually from an oil company. Yeah, he's spraying her top. And once. During World War II, women were portrayed as workers, but after the war, they were almost always shown as housewives or sex objects. In the 1960s and 70s, as more women went to work and the women's liberation movement grew, ads started to show a glamorized version of the working woman. Go up to a girl and whisper, yo ho ho, well, <laughs> for Captain Morgan Rum. Called the new woman or superwoman. Even though almost half of the workforce was made up of women by the 1970s, 
ads hadn't yet gotten the message. On the one hand, women's roles in ads didn't change much at all. Women were still thought of as housewives and sex objects. Advertisers often showed women modeling clothes or doing housework, while men were almost never shown outside of the workplace. If I'm not mistaken, train your wife in five easy lessons. Fetch your slippers and pipe, massage your feet, serve you ice cold beer and snacks, sit quietly <clears throat> while you browse your favorite television stations, respond to nonverbal cues such as snapping of fingers, answer yes to your so to any and all requests, greet you at the door wearing nothing but a, a cell phone cell phone a wrap, cell phone wrap. <clears throat> well, if I'm not mistaken, this woman here is only wearing an apron and she's serving her man a beer while he's watching television uh, with a smile on her face. Um, call me crazy, ladies, but I have a strange feeling that uh, uh, that's something that doesn't happen in your house very often. On the other hand, when the working woman was shown, it was usually in a way that was unrealistic and glamorized. This new woman was not only expected to do well at work, but also to keep up with her chores at home and make her husband happy. Yeah, I'm sure there are a bunch of racist ads there. I'm kind of curious about these. But you can go back and look at old cartoons uh, from the 40s and 50s, uh, 30s, 40s, and 50s that were pretty racist too. <coughs> Happy Aunt Jemima. Aunt Jemima. Famous for her secret recipe, pancakes, waffles, and buckwheat. What's the good word, Aunt Jemima? Well, Mr. Lyon, folks says there's nothing so pretty as a happy face and nothing so worthwhile as a happy life. Yes, Aunt Jemima, that is true. Racism has been a part of advertising. Fri <laughs> fried chicken. It's about General Electric stove, and he's eating fried chicken. I think for a long time. When black people were shown in ads, they were almost always shown as being submissive, ignorant, and unattractive. From the late 1800s, when African Americans... Bull Durham smoking tobacco, and these gentlemen here all have our stereotype... I mean, okay, these look like Jim Crow ads. ...first appeared in ads, they were often portrayed in a bad light or made fun of. Products had cartoonish pictures of black people and bleach and soap brands joked that their products could lighten dark skin and that dark skin was considered dirty. You have, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> transparent soap can make the black. <sighs> Aunt Jemima has one of the longest running ads for a ready mix self-rising flower and illustrates a stereotypical mammy. The character was based on a vaudeville performer who sang Aunt Jemima while wearing an apron and a bandana. And here you have a clean, uh, with the, uh, apparently a clean girl and a dirty girl. Uh, why doesn't your mama wash with you with fairy soap? And a scarf. The mammy figure continued to appear in 20th century television shows, radio, clothes, memorials, pancake boxes, and syrup bottles. Amazingly, Quaker Oats didn't redesign Aunt Jemima until 1989, and the brand name was finally discontinued in 2021. With the civil rights movement in the 1960s, more advertisers realized that people of different races were also consumers. That brought about more diversity in advertising as companies finally began to realize that there was more money to be made by including minorities in their ads. You know, it, when you look at these ads, these are ads from like from the 40s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, and so forth. Um, and I know they had ads like this pretty much in the 70s as well, probably maybe before they stopped. Uh, but it, it shows how, you know, if, if you don't know the story of Nichelle Nichols, who was Uhura on Star Trek, how important she really was. Uh, how Gene Roddenberry used her on Star Trek. You know, if you don't know the story, she tried to leave Star Trek after the first season, uh, but uh, Gene Roddenberry told her to take the weekend. I'll, I'll, I'll make a very condensed version. And she goes to this NAACP uh, uh, rally or meeting, and she's told that somebody wants to meet her. And that person who wanted to meet her was uh, the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. 
and he told her, basically told her, you can't leave that show because they you see us, they see us how we really are. <clears throat> when you look at these ads, that's not. I mean, I, I I work with a lot of people of color of different ethnicities uh, at my job, and they don't look or, or act like anything that you see in these in these. Ever. And then I'm sure they didn't act like anything like that back then either. But yeah, it's just uh, complete ignorance of these ads that uh, allowed them. Well, you know lack of knowledge you know and it's a good thing that you know I, th these things like this don't belong uh, in advertisement anymore i'm glad that uh they stopped doing these i was overweight and looked terrible but aids helped me lose 46 pounds aids you're glad you got aids the aids diet plan helped me lose 28 pounds aids helps control your appetite oh, I was I was thinking of the, the disease, not the, okay, AIDS. So you lose weight, yet AIDS lets you taste, chew, and enjoy. And the appetite suppressant in AIDS is not a stimulant. AIDS helped me to lose 18 pounds, and it doesn't contain anything to make me nervous. Question, why take diet pills when you can enjoy AIDS? AIDS helps you lose weight without making you jittery. In the 1800s, there was no Food and Drug Administration to keep track of what health products could say in their advertising. Because of that, a popular market for so-called patent medicines grew. Manufacturers of these medicines often made false claims and kept their full ingredient lists and formulas secret. That's for heroin. But we now know that they often contained addictive ingredients like cocaine, opium, morphine, and alcohol. Products like cough drops with heroin, toothache medicine with cocaine, and asthma-relieving cigarettes were sold over-the-counter with the help of colorful ads. There were no federal laws regulating the sale of drugs like morphine or cocaine before the Harrison Narcotics Act of 1914. Even in states that had rules about selling drugs as early as the 1880s, those rules were not part of the criminal code. I wasn't even aware of this, that they were selling things like that. I mean, I, I had an idea of what they were, about certain drugs, there, but I didn't know they had all this. And the laws that were in place weren't strictly enforced. A person who was addicted to morphine could take the same old, worn-out prescription to a druggist who would fill it again and again. Now, I know George Carlin did a, did a, a, a stand-up back in the early 70s about some of the drugs. Uh, you know, two in the mouth, son. St. Joseph. You know, things like that. Finger. <laughs> Shoots rockets that burst and bombs that explode and fights with a pen and signals in code. Shoots message missiles and watch them go. And it looks like your finger and how will they know? Six fingers, six fingers, six fingers. Here's how to get it on the card right there. Less than two dollars everywhere. Six finger, six finger, man alive. How did I ever get along with five? Many people worry about how much advertising their kids see. Yeah, that's something. I mean, that. <laughs> yeah, you. This is a rather interesting video. Some of the things that they came up with back then, six fingers, and they're using it, you know, like a like a like a toy gun and things like that, or. I mean, I, I, there's nothing really wrong with, with, with these, some of these things, but, uh, well, some of these things look, 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 look pretty dangerous, too. With the rise of Saturday morning cartoons in the 1960s and children's programming on TV, we tend to think that ads aimed at kids were a fairly new thing. But at the beginning of the 20th century, advertisers started selling to kids instead of their parents. In the early 1900s, put a Winchester rifle in your hands of every youth in your town. Yes, everybody should own, every kid should have a rifle. Companies like the Winchester Rifle Company started contests to get people to use their products. By the late 1920s, kids could join clubs and could qualify for prizes if they used the product more. Uh, look what my kid brother did with a Western, and that's a picture of, that's a world, obviously World War II. But he's got a picture of Adolf Hitler, and it looks like he sh basically, uh, uh, Western cartridge company, so there's bullets. He shot and created a picture of Adolf Hitler with, with the bullets. 
Some companies advertise their products on radio shows and even in schools, using school officials as an endorsement. By the mid-1900s, there were many different ways for advertisers to market to kids. Most American homes already had TVs, and in 1953, the great health drink hires root beer. Root beer is a health drink? The first shows for preschoolers were broadcast. At the same time, companies ran ads for bikes, games, and other things in popular comic books. I remember seeing something like that, the Easy Bake Oven, where you could have, a, it was aimed at girls, and they could make cakes uh, with that. Food companies would publish cookbooks <laughs> that taught kids how to cook using their products. And in 1963, McDonald's started using the clown Ronald McDonald as their mascot in an effort to target children. It's fun, it's useful, now you can do almost anything with plastic. Here's a wonderful new way to make your own toys, games, gifts, and other things. Huh. Advertisers also looked at the most recent psychological studies to find the best advertising method to... Serve your kid uh, co cola uh, instead of water or milk or juice. Cola's the drink for, him, for them. Reach children and young adults. Body shame. I'm sure they had a lot of these. You know, this was me five years ago, and it's still me. As I confess, I'm a waistline watcher from way back. Well, that's enough for today. Now for a lively lift. Ice cold Coca-Cola. Well, that'll help you get your figure. You know, nothing, 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 nothing reduces your weight like uh some uh, Coca-Cola, some Atlanta, Georgia sugar water to, uh, to, to help you lose weight. No waistline worry with Coke, you know. Actually, this individual size bottle has no more calories than half a grapefruit. Body shaming. <laughs> so you're comparing a uh, healthy fruit to a, a Coke bottle, or some Coca-Cola. Okay. It has been going on for a long time. The perfect body image movement really started at the beginning of the 1900s. Media and ads began to show more and more pictures of the perfect female body in order to make it easier to sell their fat reducing or, in some cases, fat gaining products. The perfect... Men wouldn't look at me when I was sitting, skinny, so I gained 10 pounds. ...body for both men like and women pounds. is influenced by the media and also... Something... Uh, Someone ought to tell her about Rye Crisp. Okay. Lose ugly fat, win admiration. Okay, so they're at a kissing booth. The guys are all lined up to kiss the attractive one, and there's a heavy set woman there, and nobody, no, nobody wants anything to do with her. So, by changes in the way that society decides what the ideal body type should be. People often have the wrong idea about body shaming. Many people think that it means making fun of people who are overweight. But studies show that body shaming also happens to people who are too thin by setting beauty and body standards that are unobtainable for most people. If you made it this far, nobody loves a fat girl. Okay. <laughs> hit that subscribe button below. It really does help me out. And let me know your thoughts about these ads from the past in the comments below. Until next time, this is Rich from Rerun Zone, signing off. Yeah, this was pretty good. This was interesting. These are ads from way back in the day and... Yeah, I can understand, you know, these, these weren't too horrible, uh, but they were pretty uh, bad regardless. I mean, they, 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 I, I was expecting they might be a little bit worse than what they actually were, but um, uh, I, think, I think the racist ads probably, you know, that, that just comes from ignorance, okay? Um, again, I'm glad the sexist ads, are, you know, again, if, if you grew up in that time frame, which I did not, you know, you've seen kind. Of, you look at the movies back then and and, and things like that. It's uh, times have changed. Times have changed for the better, and they're still changing. It's a constant evolution. Uh, we're we're not we're not there yet, but we're a hell of a lot uh, far beyond what these are. And uh, I mean, he's right. If if you put an ad, some of the the racist ads. Um, which probably weren't considered racist, obviously weren't considered racist back in the time, but are considered racist now. The sexist ones, which weren't considered sexist back then, but certainly considered sexist now. When you put that all together, uh, we have made some strides and improvements, and we still have a ways to go, but 
you know, this was actually quite interesting. Uh, and it has me shaking my head on some of these ads. But thanks for watching. Have a good rest of your day. Thanks. And uh, please click like, share, and subscribe for them. And like, share, and subscribe for me. Thanks for watching.